so Daniela, can we can we can we move on on uh, NATO uh, in the period after uh, Berlin War collapse, actually crash of the Berlin War and of the Warsaw Pact, and uh, actually how can I say maybe it's you can understand me modern NATO modern yeah. day days NATO. Yes, I mean. If we, if we talk about NATO today, we have to say it's a completely different military alliance than NATO during the Cold War. NATO during the Cold War from 1949 to um, 1990 was uh, not bombing any country. Okay? NATO had secret armies in Western Europe, we've talked about that. But then in 1990, when the Soviet Union um, basically withdrew from Eastern Germany, and the Warsaw Pact collapsed. There was, there was this moment when people in the peace movement said, oh, now, you know, we can dissolve NATO. We don't need NATO anymore because NATO was there to fight the Soviet Union. And now uh, and Warsaw Pact. And Warsaw Pact. Now Warsaw Pact has collapsed. Let's forget and it. USSR collapsed. Yeah. So we thought we don't need NATO anymore. And then uh, NATO said, no, no, um, we're not, we're not going to dissolve. Okay. Uh, and the critical thing was in 1990, the Russians had troops in, in, in Eastern Germany, in the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, DDR. And then Gorbachev said, OK, I can, I can take out these, these Russian troops if really you want to bring Germany together. I mean, there were two parts of Germany. And these two parts were one is NATO, war, one is Warsaw Pact. And you basically can't bring them together. And then the Russians said, OK, we take our troops out and then you can bring all of Germany together and put it all into NATO. And that's, that's what, at the, at the time, the government of Helmut Kohl and uh, Foreign Ministry Genscher agreed on. And then uh, Bush, uh, the, the old and Baker, Foreign Secretary of the United States, they agreed on that. And Gorbachev said, OK, we can do that, but you have to promise that after we leave Germany and you take Germany into NATO, NATO is not going to take other countries. Okay? That NATO is not going to move one inch to the east. Because the Russians, they want, don't want NATO close to the Russian borders. They, they, they think that's too dangerous. So they said, you can take Germany. And that's actually a big present of the Russians for the German uh, reunification. And today, if you read the German media, it's always, Russians are bad, Putin is evil, and Russians are bad and Putin is evil and he's responsible for the war in Ukraine and everything. But if you think back 25 years, it was actually thanks to the Russians that the Germany German could reunify, reun reunify. So NATO grew in 1990 in the sense that the DDR was added. And then for some years there was silence, NATO remained stable, but then suddenly there was a bigger enlargement of NATO. And one country after another, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Estland, Letland, Lithuania, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Croatia, many countries joined NATO. So NATO moved closer to the Soviet East border. Area. Yeah, NATO moved east. Although in 1990 they had promised not to do that. But, you know, promise from yesterday, they forgot it, and now they moved east. And now today we're looking at the situation which is very dangerous because now NATO wants to include uh, Ukraine and also Georgia, but now Ukraine into NATO. Because if Ukraine is part of NATO, NATO troops are very close to Moscow. It's a huge country, Ukraine. And if you get that country into NATO, they will be very close. I'm against it. I think Ukraine should stay neutral. Because Russia will never allow Ukraine to be part of NATO. And if NATO tries to take Ukraine, uh, the country will, will end up into a civil war. It will collapse. Uh, OK, but if, if you look at the, this, this, this last... Uh, but in the meantime, before Ukraine, NATO, NATO was involved in Afghanistan. Yes. NATO bombed uh, Serbia. Yugoslavia, actually. 99, Serbia, yes. Part of Yugoslavia. Yeah, but that's the that's transformation of NATO. NATO today is an aggressive military alliance. It's they not defensive. No, it's not defensive because they, they, what they carry out is so called out of area operations. Out of area, what does that mean? Area is the NATO countries. And Afghanistan is not a NATO country. Okay. Uh -huh. So they bomb Afghanistan. Of, that means they can obviously. bomb any country in the world. And, and why? 
and Why? they bombed they bombed to, Afghanistan because of 9/11 to prevent something or, uh -huh. okay so there NATO said on 9/11 this is the collective defense treaty if one country is attacked all countries are attacked and after 9/11 they said now we have article 5 of NATO alliance treaty which says the US is attacked, US is a NATO member, so Canada is attacked, Germany is attacked, Norway is attacked, Greece is attacked, Turkey is attacked, uh, Spain is attacked, Roma you know, all countries are attacked, which at that point were NATO members. So that's why they were all in Afghanistan. Now obviously the debate is, you know, did we really understand 9-11? But leaving that aside, NATO used 9-11 as a pretext to attack Afghanistan. Already in 99, NATO bombed um, uh, Serbia, and there the Germans were very active. Joschka Fischer, who is the foreign minister, he's a green foreign minister. People are like, okay, green politicians are now making war, because people in Germany thought the Greens, they're not yeah, going to make peaceful, war. Yeah. Peaceful, but it's not true, unfortunately. And uh, the, the socialists, um, uh, Schröder, Gerhard Schröder, he was also very active in this war. And the American pr president, uh, Bill Clinton. Everybody thinks, oh, Bill was a funny guy, you know, he was always smiling and stuff. Yeah, but he, he bombed Serbia and he didn't have a UN mandate. So if you really look at it, if you bomb a country and you don't have a UN mandate, then it's illegal. Then it's an illegal war and it's you aggression. are a war criminal. Aggr it's aggression, yeah. It's aggr and you are a war criminal. So Bush is a war criminal because he bombed Iraq. Clinton is a war criminal he, because he bombed Serbia. They both didn't have a UN mandate. And, um, you know that in Serbia, they, for example, one bomb uh, was uh, on the Serbian radio and television, killing yep. people, cameramen and yep. technicians. And but that's how different. Yeah, they, nothing happens. Innocent people. Huh? Yeah, but if you you know if you have uh, journalists killed in Paris in January 2015, the Charlie Hebdo attack, everybody goes like, oh, you can't kill journalists. That's an attack on the freedom of speech. But if you kill journalists in Belgrade in 99 with NATO bombs, no problem. So you really, it, it is a game. It is a whole game. What do you show on television? How do you talk about it? And I'm just saying, NATO has transformed itself into a very aggressive military alliance. So I am a critic of NATO. I mean, I, I, in Switzerland, I tell people, if, you know, if we have a vote, vote no. Don't join NATO. And because what NATO does is they always put military bases in the countries. For instance, in Germany, you have this base Rammstein. And Rammstein is used by NATO and by the US to pilot the drones in Afghanistan. So drones are these airplanes that uh, send Hellfire missiles and, you know, mm -hmm. kill people on the ground. And that's a sort of, you know, Noam Chomsky, who's an American professor, he says, the drones, that's actually the biggest terrorist uh, operation going on because they kill people everywhere. More than 3,000 people being killed by drones. And you, jo you... Joystick is in Germany. The joystick is in the US. Ah, in US. The computer is in yeah, Germany in the because the signal has to move. Uh -huh, from, from port to port. Okay. Yeah, and, and the globe is like that. So from the US to Afghanistan, the signal, you know, you can put it through the waves also, but it's easier to put it through Rammstein. So the Americans have military bases in Germany. And that's, that shows you something very clear. The Americans have military bases in, in, in Kosovo, Camp yeah. Bonsteel. The Americans have military bases in Afghanistan, um, uh, Bagram A for Air Force Base. Americans have an uh, embassy in Macedonia, which is four, five floors up, uh, high and eight floors uh, down. It's not just for the wine, you know, to it's put the wine the in the cellar. It's not for the wine and it's not for the visa. No, it's eight, not for the wine and the visa. Eight, it's eight, it's a combat center. Eight floors <laughs> in the ground, inside. But that's the it's American embassy. It's the hugest, uh, const the biggest construction in Macedonia. But see, I mean, and the for American... two million people. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we have to take it very systematically. We have now 200 countries in the world. Yeah. 200 today. Macedonia, 2 million people, right? Two million. Uh, Switzerland, 8 million people. These are two small countries. Small. Small countries. But 200 countries in the world. And from these 200 countries, one country is the most powerful, and that's the United States. So as historians, we always look what is the most powerful country, and that we call the empire. 
Okay, so in the 19th century, the British they were the empire. British before that, Romanian, Austro-Hungarian, yeah. Ottoman, oh. Ottoman, Russian. You know? Yeah, people who do history they know yeah. that empires change. Yeah, that's true. The Roman Empire um, around Christ's birth, and but today it's the American Empire, and people start to reflect upon the American Empire, and they ask me, how do you measure an empire? And I always say. First, you have to look who has the most military bases around the world. It's US, 600 military bases all over the globe. And it's the Americans who have a military base in Germany and not the Germans who have a military base in the US. Okay? And it's the Americans who have a military base in Kosovo and not the Serbs who have a military base in the US. And it's the Americans who have a military base in Afghanistan and not the Afghans who have a military base in the US. And it's the Americans who have a military base in Cuba, and not the Cubans who have a military base in the US. And it's the Americans who have a military base in Japan, and not the Japanese who have a military base in the US. So, you know, if you look at the structure, very clear, the Americans are the empire. Second thing, you have to look at who has the most aircraft carriers, okay? The Americans have 10. Now, you know, if you have an aircraft carrier, you can start um, uh, uh, military planes from there, and they can bomb the countries. So they have 10. Russia and, and, and China have one or two, and the French have one or two, and, and India. The, yeah, they just have, and it's all crap, you know. Yeah. The Americans have the best military aircraft carriers, and the biggest, and so. Third, what you have to look at is who has the biggest military budget. It's the US, 600 to 700 billion dollars a year. So the collective budgets of all other NATO countries is smaller than the US budgets. Fourth, you have to look who has the biggest world currency? The dollar. That's the most important country. It's not the ruble of Russia, okay? No, no. And it's not the euro. It's not the Swiss franc. Uh, so it's the dollar. And they can print it themselves, okay? Yeah. That's something the Greek cannot do. They cannot print their currency. Um, the fifth thing you have to look at, who has the biggest power in media and film? And that's Hollywood. So in every film, you t new films like American Sniper, yeah. you watch that movie and you think, tough American guys. And you don't think that one million people in Iraq were killed by uh, illegal uh, war of aggression. So if you, if you can make the films in a way that people are convinced that the empire is good, then uh, people like to watch it. Because people like to watch the films of Hollywood because they're well done. You know, a lot of explosions, tough story, action. Hollywood really knows how to do. Yes, we. Interest. I like to watch them. In, in, when I when I was young, uh, we 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 thought that uh, Indians are evil. Yeah. And cowboys are uh, the, the good guys. And that's the thing. And that's it. And now Indians were <laughs> exterminated. <laughs> exterminated for good. That's it. And in a movie, it's a very simple trick. You just have one Indian who has a knife. Yeah. And he kills a pretty white girl. Yeah. That's and it. That's it. That's it. And in every movie it's like that. In every movie it's like that. The one who is the bad guy, okay, he does something which is really ugly. Rape a woman, kill a child, yeah. chop off a head of somebody, and then everything else is just a story. And the guys in Hollywood, they decide who's the evil guy, so they say, he's the guy who kills the girl. Well, you know, you could turn it around. You could say, let's make a film where the Cubans are bad. So the Cuban kills a little girl. Or well, let's make a, a film where the Iraq. But you, you can do opposite. For example, John yeah. Wayne to kill some innocent Indian. Yeah. Oh, you could you could make a film like then Kevin Costner did, Dances with Wolves, yeah. where the Indians are the good guys and the cowboys are the bad guys. But that was, you know, modern cinema and things change. Yeah. But I'm talking about the U.S. Empire. The U.S. Empire dominates Hollywood. It dominates military airbase. It dominates the national security surveillance states. It dominates the narrative they can on make history. Stories. If we say NATO is an aggressive um, force as a historian, I'm saying that as a, a Swiss historian, they come and say, um, or if I say 9/11 is not clear what happened there, they say, "Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist." So they can attack everybody on the whole globe who disagrees. If somebody comes and say, "Bombing Serbia was illegal. Clinton is a war criminal," they go like. Oh, you can't say that. You can't say that. Although it's a fact. And so, generally speaking, if you look at NATO today, the most interesting thing is actually how they change the politics in Europe, because now we have war in Europe. Ukraine is a country in Europe, 
and it's now 70 years since the, since the end of the, world of, of the Second World War. Now, you know, May two, 1945 was the end of the world, Second World War in Europe, not in Japan. There the Americans dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August. But in Europe, in May, it was over in 45. And now, 70 years later, the idea was, let's not have war again. Never. No to war. And now we have again war. And I've researched this, uh, this question, what happened in Ukraine? And this is, this is one of the topics that people are interested in today. What, what does the NATO do in Ukraine? What does Putin do in Ukraine? What's going on? Uh, before uh, going to the issue of Ukraine, can we a little bit uh, discuss issue of, mm, I, I can call them Mediterranean crisis, yep. actually Egypt, uh, uh, Libya, all those things uh, end with uh, Syria. And, uh, huge of, crisis. A huge crisis and yes, also crime. problem in Israel and in Palestine. Yeah. And um, everywhere, for example, in uh, in Libya, there were uh, Russians agree on no-fly zone. Yes, there. I mean this is this is th those tricks. It's a trick. Uh, yeah. It's a trick. Let's let's go back. Um, in 2011, NATO bombed Libya, and they had a UN mandate to bomb Libya. Almost. Let's put it that way. Almost. Gaddafi. Gaddafi was. Um, uh, the president of Libya, and then NATO wanted to attack him. So the Americans, the British, and the French, these three are um, standing members of the UN Security Council. They went to the Security Council and they said, Gaddafi is killing his own population. With planes. With planes. So they said, the story is this, Gaddafi has the military planes and he's killing his people. You can research the story, some things are right, some things are wrong. Okay. Let's put that aside. So the Chinese and the Russians, who are also in the Security Council, they don't trust NATO. Okay? They don't trust NATO at all because NATO bombed Serbia in 99. So they have not forgotten that. And they go like, mm, OK, what you can do is you can have a no-fly zone. We give you a mandate for a no-fly zone. That means NATO would just force all planes of Gaddafi to stay, to stay on the ground that they can't take off. And if one plane takes off, they just shoot it down. That's it. Or force it with other planes. Enforce a no-fly zone. So NATO says, uh, thank you very much. And then they transform this mandate of the UN Security Council and bomb the whole country, arm different groups who then kill Gaddafi so they have a regime change. And you know, that it, that's not what, what, the, what the mandate was. So the Russians and the Chinese in the Security Council, they go mad. They say, you know, you tricked us. You asked us for a no-fly zone and we said, OK, go ahead. And now you make a regime change. That's not what we said is OK. So what you see is it's very difficult to, to cooperate with NATO. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, Gaddafi, Gaddafi's regime, OK, it's regime. Yes. But that country in the time of Gaddafi was, how can I say, complete or organized or even even good compare, uh, in compare for uh, how it looks today. Yes. Libya today is a mess. It and is a failed state. Why change a regime on worse? You know, people always say, I mean, the, the NATO countries, I mean, the US, for instance, they say we care very much for the people in Libya. Okay. Gaddafi killed okay. these people. Now, now, they don't care. Today, you can see they don't care. Libya is not in the news anymore. Nobody cares whether people are getting killed there. I have a friend. Tribes are killing over there. Yeah, they're killing each other. But the same in Afghanistan, you know. Um, what you have is this idea that you can go to a country you bomb it, and then you have peace, democracy, Elections. and prosperity, election, and kids can go to school. It's total nonsense. It, it doesn't Im work like impossible. that. It's impossible. It's like if you say, I have a problem here in my eye, I can't see very well. And then I take a big hammer and say, wait a moment, we can solve this problem. The th it, it doesn't work together. Okay? You, if you do eye surgery, this is very small with, with laser, and you cannot take a hammer. 
If you do it with a hammer and you hit the whole forehead, you crush the skull, you have bleeding and you die. And that's what we see in Libya. You have NATO bomb the country. It's like you crush the skull with a hammer. This is a whole mess. And if you take Iraq, okay, 2003, the country was attacked. It's a huge mess. A lot of people who worked for Saddam Hussein, who were in the army of Saddam Hussein, they uh, were, you know, defeated by the Americans. Then they lost their job, they had no money, but they were very, very radical, very, very angry. They're Sunni um, Muslim, and they are now part of the core structure of Islamic State, IS. So the whole destabilization that you have there is just ongoing. And the same in Afghanistan. You can so say... NATO and U U United States, they didn't bring peace to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Libya, no. to Egypt. No, and there is a very interesting guy in the United States. His name is called George Friedman. Uh, he's the director of Stratfor. And he says the American empire, first of all, is an empire. You have to, we talked about this. Yeah. But he said most people in America don't want to even think about that they're an empire. They don't want to know it. So, you, in, you know, on CNN, it doesn't say the U.S. empire is today bombing Libya. It doesn't say so. Never. The word empire is not used. People, not, even in the Swiss newspaper, empire, U.S., does not, they don't say it. But obviously that would be the correct name, the American empire. So he says, uh, George Friedman, the Ameri U.S. is an empire, first. And secondly, the U.S. empire cannot control Europe and Asia. This whole two continents is called Eurasia. Eurasia yeah. So what he says is, what we should do is, in order to block this zone, is we could, should create chaos. Okay? We should, he says, we... What Reagan did, U.S. President Reagan, who was in, the, in power in the 1980s, he supplied both Iran and Iraq with weapons. And George Freeman, now in, in, in 2050, gave a talk and said, that was a very good idea. Because Iran and the Iraqis, they were killing each other, and that made them weaker. And he said, Americans were giving so weapons to Saddam Hussein and to Khomeini, to both. And he says, it's cynical. It's immoral, but it worked. Because uh, he says, if Americans put troops on the ground in Europe, they're immediately outnumbered. If they put troops on the ground in Asia, they're outnumbered immediately. So the military idea is to create chaos. To clash. To clash others. them. And he says, what we should now do, and he says this about Ukraine, he says, the best thing in the Ukraine would be the Germans and the Russian killing each other. Because then both countries get weaker and you have a lot of dead people and so And he says, I don't care, you know, women raped, people beheaded, who cares? Let's just, the Europeans, they're so stupid, they can kill each other. And we see this also in the Balkans in the Bosnian war. What happened is everything got worse, okay? It didn't get better, it got worse. When people kill each other, you just have to look at the, def at the fault lines. In Ukraine, for instance, you have half of the country who speaks Russian, that's to the east, and half of the country which, which speaks Ukrainian, which is in the west. And if you look at this fault line, that's where it breaks. Or if you look at Bosnia, you have three different religions. That's where it breaks. You have the, the Catholic, you have the Orthodox, and you have the Muslims. That's where a country breaks. Or if you look at Switzerland, for instance, we have three languages. Italian, German, and French. If any evil empire ever wants to break Switzerland, it would break it along the language borders. And that's what they now try to do, I think, in the Ukraine, because the government of Poroshenko, which is the government in Kiev, is the, so the Ukrainian speaking, is with NATO, and the Russian speaking is with Russia. And it is very, very dangerous to look at the situation, especially because people think, NATO wants to bring stability, stability to Afghanistan, stability to, to Syria, stability to Iraq, stability to Libya. But it's not true. It's enough for NATO to sell the guns, the missiles, etc., and to create chaos. That is a business model. So, uh, do you think that, that Syria is uh, the breaking point where uh, Russia and China, especially Russia, say, okay, that's it, on Mediterranean, see on Euro, uh, Middle East, uh, Asia uh, field, that's it. 
you are we, you, you are stopping here. I I think that you know Russia and China are not stupid. They are observing the American empire. They are studying the American empire. And they see that the American empire has bombed Libya and has destroyed the government of Gaddafi. So, you know, that the American empire carried out regime change in Libya in 2011. That's a fact. And uh, they see that the American government wants to carry out regime change in Syria with Assad. But Assad is much more difficult. It's much more difficult for many years now already. Um, the Americans, the British, together with the Saudis, the Turkish Turkey. and Qatar. Okay, these countries try to overthrow um, Assad, um, and and they say, you know, Assad is torturing um, his people and he's an evil man. It's always the same story, you know. Saddam Hussein is an evil man; he has to go. Now Iraq is a chaos. Um, Gaddafi uh, also. Gaddafi is an evil man; he has to go. Now the country is a chaos. Milosevic was an evil man; he has to go. Um, Bin Laden is an evil man; now he's dead or not? Who knows? Probably dead in the Indian Ocean somewhere. It's always this story of the evil man. This is basically how international politics is explained to the stupid. It's it's, it's an evil man out there, and he has to be killed. And when he's dead, everything is fine. And it's a very stupid story. Because basically international politics is about access to oil, to gas, to resources. It's about the extensions of military alliance like NATO. It's about regime change. It's about opening up markets so you can import. It's about, you know, it's about money. It's not about the evil man. The evil man story was for the kids when you're five years old or eight years old. So. Okay, but uh, if, we, if we come to Assad, it's again not about the evil man. It's about, you know, there are pipelines going from Iran to the middle uh, uh, Mediterranean. And these pipelines, if Assad is there in power, he controls together with the Iranians and the Iraqis. They can control these pipelines, oil and gas. But Saudi Arabia, for instance, they want to see Assad down. So they have a Sunni um, uh, man in Damascus. Mm -hmm in power in Syria, uh, because they want to have their pipelines to the Mediterranean. Many people have forgotten that in 1956 we had the Suez Crisis with, with Nasser and everything. And Nasser at the time blocked uh, uh, the ships from going through Egypt to the Straits of Suez and the Red Sea. And at the same time he also blocked the pipelines in Syria. Because you can obviously come bring the oil and the gas through the tankers or through the pipelines. You have two choices. So the fight for Syria for me is a, a fight for pipelines. And what I think is that indeed China and Russia have said, we try, okay, we try to support Assad so that he doesn't fall. And maybe they are successful, we don't know. Um, it's uh, also the Hezbollah who is uh, supporting uh, uh, Assad and it's also Iran who is supporting Assad. Whereas Saudi Arabia tries to overthrow him, Turkey tries to overthrow him, the US, and, and we don't know what will happen. I mean, okay, he's still uh, in power. He's still in power. In a few days, you are going to, to Germany uh, to speak about regime change in Ukraine. Yeah. Can you tell to my audience a little bit about uh, the core of that? Uh, Debate. Yes, I mean the, uh, the 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 story about the Ukraine started in February two thousand and fourteen, when the government of Yanukovych crashed, and the new government of Poroshenko and Yazenyuk came to power, and um, basically you know people here in Switzerland they and also in Germany they think Putin is responsible for the chaos in Ukraine. They say Putin is responsible because. Russian soldiers occupied the Crimea, which is part of Ukraine. So obviously we have here an example of Russia going out and just trying to grab land. Now I always say, wait a moment. The occupation of Crimea was indeed done by Putin. That's true, he did that. Um, but you already had Russian troops there before. Um, this is um, a military base in Sevastopol of the Russians, which has been there for many years. It's like the military base of the Americans in Cuba, like Guantanamo. So it's not that Russian troops went there. They were there before. And now people say, yeah, yeah, but then, you know, they... There was a referendum in Crimea, not... There was no referendum in Kosovo. For that's it. That's the next thing. They say, 
uh, people in Crimea could des decide whether they wanted to join Russia and they decided to join Russia. In Kosovo we didn't have that. And now obviously I say we should not only focus on the Crimea when we talk about uh, Ukraine, we should talk about the Maidan. So we should talk about um, uh, the protests on the Maidan uh, in Kiev and we should talk about the regime change because the, it is a very interesting question. How, how did Yanukovych lose his power? I, I've asked a few friends, do you actually think that Putin uh, overthrew uh, 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 Yanukovych and people go like, oh, I don't know, no, I don't think so because Putin was a friend of Yanukovych so probably he didn't overthrow him. And I say, yes, Putin didn't want that Yanukovych fell, so uh, there's got to be somebody else. And then I looked at an American CIA analyst, his name is Ray McGovern, and he said the change of government in the Ukraine was done by the West. Now what does that mean, the West? The West means NATO, means US, means CIA, um, could include Poland, Germany, but basically means the United States. So I said, well what is the data that actually says that the government in Kiev was, was toppled? by the West. Now the data that supports this theory, and I'm saying this is ongoing historical research, we still don't know what's going on but you know we have to look at it. And the data which supports this is there was a, an American uh, ambassador, Jeffrey Pyatt, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the person from the American foreign ministry responsible for politics in Europe, Victoria Newland, who talked on the phone. Uh, before uh, Yanukovych fell from power and uh, they talk, they're two Americans, the American ambassador in Ukraine and uh, the, the lady from the US uh, foreign ministry who is in, in Washington. So they talk about Ukraine and the government in Ukraine and they say the government should change. Okay, They say the old government should go, we should have a new government. And so the American ambassador says, um, what, about you? what about Klitschko? We should have Klitschko in the government. And then uh, Victoria Newland, Klitschko, the boxer, yeah. she said, no, no, we shouldn't have Klitschko, he, we shouldn't have him in the government. Let's, let's take Jazz, Jasenyuk, Arseniy Jasenyuk, after the putsch, he became the prime minister. And that's exactly the, the, the telephone communication be between the American ambassador in Ukraine and the American foreign minister in Washington. And then um, the ambassador says, should we include the European Union? Yeah. And uh, Victoria Newland says, fuck the EU. Yeah, fuck <laughs> she just said, fuck the EU, we don't need them. So, and so that she bring uh, sandwiches to, to Maidan. To the, the and it's very, yeah, and it's, you know, it's like, if you look at this, then you say, so is this an American coup in Kiev? And if you look at the German press, you know, what they then said is, Yanukovych on the 20th of September committed a crime. Uh, 20th of February, excuse me. It's the 20th of February 2014. So I looked at it and I said, what happened on that day? You have the protesters on the Maidan and uh, the protesters, they were not just, you know, standing there with peaceful signs and saying, we want the new government, we want the new government. I mean, Yanukovych probably was a corrupt guy, no, no doubt about it. But, you know, they were not peacefully protesting. They were smashing the police with chains. They were throwing Molotovs, Kopka. So there was a clash between police and, and, and the protesters. And then on that morning, at five o'clock in the morning, it starts that you have snipers on, on, the roofs. on the roofs and they shoot. And now that's interesting. They kill demonstrators and police. The police has a special unit, which is called the Berkut, and they're there and the demonstrators out there. And then I look at it and I say, that is very strange. If, if it had been the people of Yanukovych, the snipers, they wouldn't shoot the police because the police was protecting his government against the demonstrators. If you are the president, you don't shoot the people who are trying to keep you in power. I would be very stupid, right? Yeah. So I'm saying, I don't understand this. And then I looked at the, um, the doctors in the hospitals in Kiev. And they say the bullets it's that we find in the demonstrators and the bullets that we find in the policemen, in the dead bodies, it's the same bullets. And I go like, Jesus Christ, this is strange. It looks like, and now obviously I, I don't, I was not there and I, I don't have the truth uh, monopoly here. I, I just say 
It looks like this was a covert operation to create chaos. To create chaos in the Ukraine and... Civil war. Yeah, to create civil war. And in fact, it's very easy. You just put snipers on the roof. Kill both sides. Kill both sides. People are confused. Get angry. Get angry. It's all chaos. And you blame it on the president. The president has to flee. In the German media, you write evil dictator kills his own people. Okay. Everybody in Europe very angry. Yanukovych has to flee. I think he fled to Russia, I guess. Yeah. And then you bring a new president, Poroshenko. You install Yazanyuk, the guy, before you call on the phone. We bring that guy in. And uh, then the new government, you arm it and you train it. And the new government says, OK, we want to bring Ukraine into NATO. So in the meantime, everybody forgot uh, those people in Odessa who were killed, bur burned, burned alive. alive. Yeah. Nobody. It's a no issue. A no issue. Yeah, but you know the no funny issue. thing is, Burn. I tell you, I tell you, in 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 Switzerland and in Germany, that's the two countries I look at very very closely. Most people only hear Putin is evil, Putin is a problem, and they never hear about the details of the regime change. Did you just don't hear about it? I was I was at a very high ranking banking. Um, event uh, for two weeks ago and I had a presentation I was talking with people who are making investments all over the world and you know people who are well informed who trade in millions and I asked them so what do you think who who actually overthrew Yanu Yanukovych who overthrew him who was it and they say I don't know we, we, there were demonstrators and there was shooting and Klitschko. <laughs> there was Klitschko and it was it's unclear so I decided, because I saw that most people don't know about the February 20, 2014 military coup, that I want to talk about this in Berlin and I'm giving a, a talk about this. Uh, On the 70th anniversary of the Second World War end, I'm talking about the regime change in Ukraine. What do you think about Russia? Today's Russia is it, and Putin, of course. Is it aggressive, non-aggressive? Uh, you know that uh, on September 9th, uh, limited amount of world leaders will go on the parade, but Angela Merkel will uh, is there next day on 10th. So, what do you think? Russia is aggressive, non-aggressive? Should the Baltic states be uh, should uh, afraid for their sovereignty, or what do you think? I think if we look at Russia, then we see it was aggressive between 1918 and 1988. It was fighting a war in Afghanistan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think... That was Soviet Union. Yeah, that was the Soviet Union. And I think under Stalin, uh, Stalin killed a lot of people. A lot of... He, you know, he just took them and he sent them to the Gulag. And these were innocent people. They were intellectuals, historians like me. And he just killed them. Thousands and Inclu thousands. Including their, uh, his Georgians. Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah. you know, there's a very, very tragic history to Russia. I'm asking about today. And today, today, I think Russia is not a danger. I think America is much more aggressive. If you look at the facts, did Russia bomb Serbia? No, the US bombed Serbia. Did Russia uh, uh, bomb Libya? No, the US bombed Libya. Did Russia start this new phase of the Afghanistan war in 2001? No, the British and the Americans and the French did. Did Russia bomb the, uh, Iraq in 2003? No, the, uh, the, uh, the Americans did and, and the British did. So really, if you look at the events of the last 25 years, so after the fall of the, so of the Soviet Union, and this is modern Russia, you know, 25 years, the Berlin Wall really is the big change, okay? And after Gorbachev, I'm talking Yeltsin, I'm, I'm talking Putin. Then I really think that in this time period, the last 25 years, uh, uh, um, uh, NATO was aggressive and not, uh, Russia was not aggressive. NATO became, came closer to the Soviet border and not the other way around. What can you expect from Russia now? I think... To protect part of Ukraine or yes, to uh, give up or... No, Russia will never give up. You know, Russia has fought Hitler, okay? Uh, and Russia has fought Napoleon. <laughs> Russia has never given up. So, no, giving up for Russia is not an option because Russia is the biggest country in the world. 
There's no country that big. So that means you cannot occupy Russia. Russia is not like Switzerland and Macedonia. You could, you know, small territory you can occupy, but absolutely impossible to uh, occupy Russia. What you can do is you can, um, uh, if you are America or if you are NATO, you can encircle Russia. Okay, you can put military bases in Afghanistan. Throughout. You can put military bases in Poland. You can put military bases in, in Japan, Turkey, yeah, yeah. in Japan. You can put all around. But still, you can't occupy the country. But what you can do is you can try to push and bring NATO, uh, Russia into a new war. Now, they don't want war. Then you trigger them. You kill a few Russians, uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians, okay? Or um, there's a huge debate about MH17, this plane, which was downed. And there's two theories. One theory is that it was a book missile, that is a uh, land-to-air missile, and that the Russians gave this missile to the uh, separatists in Ukraine. And the other story is that the Poroshenko government in Kiev had an airplane, an Su-25, um, so a military jet, and that a military jet went into the air and shot the other plane uh, with an air-to-air -air missile and with cannon from the board of the... And so, you know, it's a huge debate. But in this... And I don't know what the truth is. I only know that this plane went down. And I know that this is again used to say Putin is evil. Yes, but why should Putin uh, shut down the plane? No, I don't think that Putin did it. Putin didn't there do it. No but it, it is... Maybe, maybe Poroshenko did it. We don't know. Maybe the, the military of the Ukraine did it just to make it more violent, the whole crisis. And what I'm saying, if I'm look, looking at the data that uh, George Friedman in the US of Stratford said, he said, the idea is let's ki create chaos. Let's have the Germans and the Russians kill the, killing kill it. Between themselves. Yeah. yeah, kill each other. People go like, people in Germany go like, no, I mean, that's not possible. And I say, who's going to profit? The US is going to profit if Germany goes down and Russia goes down. Yeah. What, who, would, who would lose if Germany and Russia would say, okay, now together we're going to have a peace deal, Ukraine is going to go neutral, and we're going to have a very, very good economic deal. You give us cheap gas and we give you uh, industrial uh, know-how and capital, and uh, then we both get stronger. Now the empire doesn't want that. On the end, uh, Daniele, first of all, thank you for this interview. Um, I bring a lot of people in the last few seasons all over from the world, from South Africa, from Mexico, from United States, from Russia, from Europe, including your uh, friend Matthias Scherne. And uh, they all have their, their um, they all explain what they think. Yeah. And on the end, we need to, to give an idea to the, to the audience uh, about the future of this yes. planet, about the future of the humanity, yeah. uh, of, of us, yes. actually, of normal people. We are not all with guns and with, with weapons and with joysticks. We, yep. we want to live our, our normal life. What yes. do you think? Well, where are we going? Actually? Yeah, um, I think, first of all, everybody has to sort of wake up and understand we're living in interesting times. Uh, I think it is very important that human beings realize that wars are a product. Wars are not something which happen. Uh, wars are always something somebody wants them to happen where they happen. And also terrorism, you know, I, I encourage everybody to really be um, critical of, of terrorist attacks and look at it from different angles. But I also say that my research into terrorism and into wars is research into very dark, dark topics. It's very sad, you know, people get raped, shot, tortured even, everything. It's very, very ugly. And I'm always saying it is 1% of the human population which is actively engaged in killing each other. One percent. That's 70 million people. 70 million people is, you know, you take all the people in the IS, okay, that's okay, you still have a, many millions. You take everybody in Ukraine who's killing each other, you remember. Then you take everybody in Afghanistan killing each other. You take everybody in, in Sudan. <laughs> you take all the people who are actually killing each other and torturing each other. And you take them together and you find, okay, they're from different nations. They're, most are men, that has to be said, but it's 70 million. 
the other 99 million, what do they do? 99%. 99%. Ex the other 99%. Uh, what are they doing? They're like, like we are. What do they want? They want to fall in love. Okay. Sure. They want to have pets, have kids. dogs or, 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 or cats. Kids. They want to have kids. And they Education. want they want that their kids, you know, learn to read and to write. They want to make some money, okay, so they can buy a car and go on a holiday. They want to drink wine and talk about or, or drink uh, vodka or whatever. They just want to have a good time, relax, party, listen to music. And if you go to them and say, hey, instead of, you know, drinking go wine... And, go and kill somebody. Yeah, don't you want to sort of um, uh, torture somebody? You know, no. <laughs> And then you go, oh, don't you want to bomb that country? And they're like, no. And then they're like, don't you want to, you know... Uh, uh, cripple somebody. Yeah, just shoot somebody in the head. They're going, no. Or don't you want with a chain, you take off an arm like that? Don't you want to do that tonight instead of mowing your lawn? People are going, no. So what you see is that 99% of people are wonderful human beings. I mean, I personally think it's great to live in, on, on planet Earth. And I think human beings are wonderful. You know, we can talk to each other and uh, we don't have to agree all the time. It's okay to have conflicts. Okay, what is a conflict? A conflict is if somebody says, I see it like that. And the other one says, it's, I see it like that. And they don't agree. I like this movie. I don't like that. Yes. The same movie or yeah. picture or music. And you don't have to agree. Or even on political issues, you know, somebody likes NATO, somebody doesn't like NATO. That's okay. You can have a debate. But the debate means you talk to each other. You don't shoot each other. It's like husband and wife, okay, at home. Uh, they have a quarrel about, you know, whether, I don't know, many, many possibilities <laughs> to quarrel. Many, many, many. That's a war. There, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that's a quarrel. And then, you know, this is okay. I say the conflict is okay because it helps us to, to reflect our positions and to change us. We have all changed. I'm now 42 years old and I've... Uh, had a lot of debates with many people and it has changed me and it is good. Conflict is good. Conflict is very good. But violence is bad. So what is important, we should not have the conflict transform into violence. For instance, the, the man and the wife, they quarrel and then the, they disagree and the, the man gets angry and he just takes a hammer and kills the wife. Very bad, okay? The conflict, which is good, has transformed into violence, which is very bad. He's now not, it's not possible for him to evolve, you know. He's, he can never talk to his wife again. She's dead. He's going to be in prison or he's going to be traumatized. No good. Uh, or otherwise, the wife, you know, poisons the man. She thinks he's a evil man. I poison him. He's dead. Again, violence. So I always say the conflict, cherish the conflict. Have conflict with your, with your teacher. Have a conflict with your... With, the, with, your, with your kid, you know, if, if the son says to the father, hey, father, you have no clue how the world works, okay? The newspaper you're reading is full of lies. Then the father says, son, you're 20 years old. Who's paying for the house? Who's paying for your university? You have no clue. Go get, earn your money. And you can, you can have an interesting conflict on just on different positions. That is good. But what I'm saying is we should stop killing each other. It's not good for anybody. And I'm saying the majority, 99%, they don't want that killing. And I'm trying, I'm really trying as a historian to explain how the killing machine works. It's always the same game. It's this idea that you have a problem, something evil, and say this is evil. And then they say, and now we need a very, very, very big bomb. And we drop it on the evil and it will be gone. Okay, that's always the story. It's always the story that there's a problem, that we have violence, and that in order to stop violence, we have to be once very, very violent. And this story is a myth, you know. If we could... It doesn't work. Like it that. doesn't work. If we, if we as humanity, could come out of the spiral of violence with more violence, we would have done it by now. You know, we have, we've had atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We had Auschwitz, we had 60 million people dead in World War II. We've now destroyed Libya, we've destroyed Afghanistan. We have Stalin. We have, start, we have Stalin who, with, with the prison camps, we have torture in Abu Ghraib. Okay, we have done violence A to Z. We've done it all, everything. We have burned women in the Middle Ages when they knew too much, you know. We said they're witches, we burned them. So, as a human uh, family, we have a lot of experience with violence. And if we know one thing, then we know 
that we cannot, we cannot stop the wars with more war. We cannot stop the terror with more terror and we cannot overcome violence through more violence. And I think so in the 21st century, the 99, okay, there's 99%, they don't want it. From these 99%, 80%, they just don't want to talk about it, they don't want to look at it, they just want to go to work, back home, have their garden, they're private, okay, they're just private, they're not political. They, they hear all these and they think, okay, it's very sad, as long as they don't bump my house, I'm just not going to talk about it. And then there's the 9% who, who, who are very active in the peace movement and they say we should talk about it, it's not our house but houses in Afghanistan are being bombed and we should think about World War II and why are we in war in Ukraine now, all these political questions. And my, my hope is, and I'm actually positive, I don't think it's impossible, I think it's possible, that in the 21st century we will have a better understanding about peaceful coexistence. I think it's possible. And I think that people will not just say, oh, we will just kill each other forever and it will get only worse. I think the opposite is possible. I think if we talk to each other, you know, you're from Macedonia, I'm from Switzerland. You were, you were living in a communist system. I was living in a capitalist system. I'm now 42. I don't even know how old you are. 57. 57. You know, we're not, we're not the same age. But we can talk to each other. And that's an example of what everybody can do. Everyone can talk with somebody else, talk a Russian... Agree could, or not agree. Agree or not agree, have a debate, talk to each other. And in the end, you know, if somebody says, and now we have to bomb uh, Macedonia, very evil country, then I go, no, wait, I know a guy there, Emilenko. Don't bomb that country. He's a very good guy, you know. Friendly, open, interested. and. And the same with you, you know, if somebody says, now we have to bomb Switzerland, you go, oh no, there's Daniele Ganser. He, you know, I know one guy there, and maybe you know five, or you know ten, or you know a hundred. And if you know a hundred people in Iraq, you don't want the country to be bombed. No, of course. So, Daniele, I think that we uh, talk about all the t things I am interested in, and probably my, my audience also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming that you find, find the time for, for me, for my television, for my show and hope that uh, next time, next season or season after that, we will see you in Skopje. We'll talk again. Uh, we will discuss again or maybe I will come again here uh, uh, for, uh, for the end of, the, of my show. Can you Tell us to my audience a little bit about you. You like uh, mountains, uh, nature. Yes, I like nature a lot. Yeah. Um, I uh, I like snowboarding. So in Switzerland we have. Okay, you have mountains. We have mountains. <laughs> I like snowboarding, and um, I like to um, play with my kids, and I uh, like to hang out with my friends. Yes, and I love international politics. We always debate. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, thank you very much and uh, have uh, a successful uh, professional and private life after this show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.